from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. Buy the dip has been, a, been an effective strategy since the market bottomed in early March last year. The approach has been especially successful in tech and even more so for those tech names that one, were well positioned for the forced march to digital, I sometimes call it, i.e. remote work, online commerce, data centric platforms, and certain cybersecurity plays, and two, already had the cloud figured out. The question on investors' minds is where to go from here. Should you avoid some of the high flyers that are richly valued with eye-popping multiples, or should you continue to buy the dip? And if so, which companies that capitalized on the trends from last year will see permanent shifts in spending patterns that make them a solid long-term play? Hello and welcome to this week's Wikibon Cube Insights powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, we shine the spotlight on three companies that may be candidates for a buy the dip strategy. And it's our pleasure to welcome in Ivana Delevsko, who's the chief investment officer and founder of Spear Alpha, a new research centric ETF focused on industrial technology. Ivana is a longtime equity analyst with a background in both long and short investing. Ivana, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me, David. Yeah, it's really our pleasure. I, I want to start with your ETF and give the folks a bit more background about you. First, you know, we got to let people know, I'm not an investment pro, I'm not an advisor, I don't make stock recommendations, I don't sell investments. So you got to do your own research. I have a lot of data, so happy to share it, but you got to understand your own risks. You, of course, Yvonne, on the other hand, you do offer investment services. And so people before investing, you got to carefully review all the available, available investment docs, understand what you're getting into before you invest. Now with that out of the way, Ivana, I have some stats up here on this slide. You know, Spear, you're a newly launched female-led firm that does deep research into the supply chain. We're going to talk about that. You try to uncover, as I understand it, underappreciated industrial tech firms in some pretty, pretty cool areas that we list here. But tell us a little bit more about your background and your ETF. So thanks for having me, David. Um, my background is in industrial research and uh, industrial technology investments. Um, I've spent the past 15 years covering this space. And what we've seen over the past five years is technology changes that are really driving fundamental shifts in, uh, in industrial manufacturing processes. So whether this is 5G connectivity, innovation in the software stack, increasing compute speeds, all of these are major technological advancements that are impacting uh, traditional manufacturers. So what we try to do is assess, speak to these firms and assess who is at the leading and who is at the lagging end of this digital transformation. And we're trying to assess what vendors they're using, what processes they're implementing, and that is how we generate most of our investment ideas. Okay, great. And, and I, we show on the bottom of, of this sort of intro slide, if you will, uh, so one of the processes that you use. And one of the things that, that is notable, a lot of people compare you uh, to Kathy Wood's ARC investments when you came out. Uh, I think you, you use a, a, a different process. I mean, maybe there are some similarities in terms of disruption, but at the, the, the bottom of this slide, it shows a McKinsey sort of graphic that, that I think informs people as to how you really dig into the supply chain from a research standpoint. Is that right? Absolutely. So for us, it's all about understanding the supply chain, going deep in the supply chain and gather data points from primary sources that we can then translate into investment opportunities. So if you look at this McKinsey graph, uh, you will see that there is a lot of opportunity to, for these companies to transform themselves both on the front end, which means better revenue, better products, and on their operation side, which means lower cost, whether it's through better operations or through better processes on the, the back end. So what we do is we will speak to a traditional manufacturing company and ask them, okay, well, what do you use for better product development? And they will give us the name of the firms and give us an assessment of what's the differences between the competitors, why they like one versus the other. So then we're going to take the data and we will put it into our financial model and we'll understand the broader market for it, um, the addressable market, the market share that the company has, and we'll project the growth. So for this 
higher growth stocks that, that you cover, the main alpha generation uh, potential here is to understand what the amount of growth that these companies will generate over the next 10 to 20 years. So it's really all about projecting growth in the next three years, in the next five years, and where will growth ultimately settle in, in the next 10 to 20 years. Love it. We're going to have a fun conversation because today we're going to get into your thesis for Coupa, Snowflake, and Zscaler. We're going to bring in some of our own data, some of our data from ETR, and, and why you think these companies may be candidates for long-term growth and, and, and be by the dip stock. So to do that, I hacked up this little comparison slide that you're showing here. I do this for context. Our audience knows I'm not a CFA or a valuation expert, but we like to do simple comparisons just to give people context and a sense of relative size, growth and valuation. And so this chart attempts to do that. So what I did is I took the most recent quarterly revenue for Coupa Snowflake and Zscaler, multiplied it by four to get a run rate. We included ServiceNow in the table just for baseline reference because Bill McDermott, as we've reported, aspires to make ServiceNow the next great enterprise software company alongside with Salesforce and Oracle and some of the others. And, and all these companies that we list here, the three, the three here, you know, they aspire to do so in their own domain. So we're displaying the market cap from Friday morning, September 10th. We calculated a revenue run rate multiple and we show the quarterly revenue growth. And what this data does is gives you a sense of the three companies, they're well on their way to a billion dollars in revenue. It underscores the relationship between revenue growth and valuation, Snowflake being the poster child for that dynamic. So Vanna, I know you do much more detailed financial analysis, but let's talk about uh, these companies in order, maybe start with Coupa. They just crushed their quarter. I mean, they blew away consensus on the top line. What else about the company do you like and, and why is it on your buy the dip list? So just to back up David on valuation, these companies, investors either directly or indirectly value on a DCF basis. And what happened at the beginning of the year as interest rates started increasing, people started freaking out. And once you plug in a hundred basis points higher interest rate in your DCF model, you get significant price downside. So that really drove a lot of the pullback at the beginning of the year. Right Now where we stand today, interest rates haven't really moved all that significantly off the bottom. Off the bottom. They're still around the same levels, maybe a little bit higher, but those are not the types of moves that are going to drive significant downside in this stock. So as things have stabilized here, a lot of these opportunities look pretty attractive on that basis. So Coupa specifically came out of our, um, if you go back to that, uh, that, the chart of like where the opportunities lie in, um, in across the manufacturing uh, um, enterprise, Coupa is really focused on business spend management. So they're really trying to help companies reduce their cost. Uh, and they're a leader in the space. Uh, they're unique, uh, unique in that they're cloud-based. So the feedback we've been hearing from from our companies that use it, JetBlue uses it, Train Technologies uses it. The feedback we've been hearing is that they love the ease of implementation. So it's very easy to implement and it drives real savings, um, savings for these companies. So we see in our DCF model, we see multiple years of this 30, 40% growth and that's really driving our price target. Yeah, and I, we can, I can confirm that. I mean, I mean just anecdotally, you know, you know, we serve a lot of the technology community and many of our clients uh, are saying, hey, okay, you know, when you go to do invoicing or whatever, you work with procurement, it's Coupa. You know, this is some Ariba, it's kind of the legacy, which is SAP. We'll talk about that a little later, but let's talk about Snowflake. Um, you know, Snowflake, we've been tracking them very closely. We know the management there. We've watched them through their last two companies now here uh, and have been following that company early on since, since really 2015. Uh, tell us why you like Snowflake um, and, and maybe why you think it can continue its rapid growth. Thanks, David. So first of all, I need to compliment you on your research on the company on the technology side. Thank so you. where we come in is more from understanding where our companies can use soft Snowflake and where Snowflake can add value. So what we've been hearing from our companies is the challenge that they're facing is that everybody's moving to the cloud, but it's not as simple as just send your data to the cloud and call AWS and they're going to generate more revenue for your solve your cost problem. So what we've been hearing is that companies need to find tools that are easy to use where they can use their own domain expertise and just plug and play. So 
Um, ANSYS is one of the companies we covered the dust simulation. They have found Snowflake to be an extremely useful tool in sales lead generation. And within sales, CRM systems have been around for a while and they're, they've really been implemented, but analyzing sales numbers is something that is new to this company. Some, some of our companies don't even know what their sales are, even when they look back after the quarter is closed. So tools like this help um, companies do easy analytics and therefore drive revenue and cost savings growth. So we see really big runway for, for this company. And I think the most misunderstood part about it is that people view it as a warehousing, data warehousing play, while this is all about compute. And the company does a good job separating the two and what our their customers like, or like the companies that we cover like about it, is that it can lower their compute costs um, and make it much easier, much more easily manageable for them. Great, and we're going to talk about more about each of these companies, but let's talk about Zscaler a bit. I mean, Zscaler is a company we've been very excited about uh, and identified them kind of early on. They've definitely benefited from the move to cloud, generally and specifically the remote work uh, situation with the, with the cyber threats, et cetera. But tell us why you like Zscaler. So interestingly, Zscaler, um, we, we like the broader security space, um, the, the broader cyber security space. And interestingly, our companies are not yet spending to the level that is commensurate with the increase in attack rate. So we think this is a trend that is really going to accelerate as we go forward. Um, my own board, 20% of the time on the last board meeting was spent on cybersecurity, what we're doing. And this is a pretty simple operation that, that we're running here. So you can imagine for a large enterprise with thousands of people all around the world, um, need, needing to be on a, on a single simple system, Zscaler really fits well here. Very easy to implement. Several of our industrial companies use it. Siemens uses it, G uses it, and they've had great, great experience with, with it. Excellent. I just want to take a quick look at how some of these names have performed over the last year and, and what, if anything, this data tells us. This is a chart comparing the past 12 months performance of, of those four companies uh, that we just talked about and we added in you know, ServiceNow. Zscaler, as you can see, has outperformed the other despite your commentary on discounted cash flow. Snowflake has underperformed really precisely for the reasons that you mentioned, not to mention the fact that it, it was pretty highly valued. Uh, and you can see relative to the NAS, but it's creeping back uh, lately after very strong earnings, even though the stock dropped after it beat earnings because the street wants the CFO to say, to guide even higher than maybe as Mike Scarpelli feels is prudent. And you can see Cooper has also underperformed, relatively speaking. I mean, it absolutely destroyed consensus this week. The stock went up, but it's been off with the, the weaker market this week. I know you like to take a longer term view, but, but anything you would add here? Yeah, so interestingly, both Zscaler and Coupa were in the camp of, as we went into earnings, expectations were already pretty high because few of their competitors reported very strong results. So Zscaler yesterday, their revenue growth was, was pretty strong. The stock is down today. Uh, and the reason is because people were kind of caught up a little bit in the noise of this quarter growth is 57, last quarter it was 60, like is this a deceleration? We don't see it as that at all. And the company brought up one point that I thought was extremely interesting, which is as their deal sizes are getting larger, it takes a little longer time for them to see the revenue come through. So it takes a little bit of time to, for you to see it into, uh, from billings into, into revenue. Uh, same thing with Coupa, very strong earnings report, but I think expectations were already pretty high going into it, uh, given the service now and, um, and Anna Plan as well reported strong results. So I think it's all about positioning. So we love these setups where you can buy the dip in on this opportunity where like people get caught up in um, short term noise and, and it creates good entry points. Excellent. I, I want to bring in some data from our partner ETR and see if you have any comments, Ivana. So what we're showing here is a two dimensional chart. We like to show this uh, very frequently. It's based on a survey of between 1,000 and 1,500 chief information officers and technology buyers every quarter. This is from their most recent July survey. The vertical axis shows net score, which is a measure of spending momentum. I mean, it measures the net percentage of customers in the survey that are spending more 
on a particular product or platform. In other words, it essentially subtracts the percentage of customers spending less from those spending more, which yields a net score. It's more granular than that, but basically that's what it does. The horizontal axis is market share or pervasiveness in the data set. It's not revenue market share like you get from IDC. It's, it's a mention market share. And now that red dotted line at the 40% mark on the vertical represents an elevated level. In other words, anything above 40% we consider notable. And we've plotted our three buy the dip companies and included some of their competitors for context. And you can see we added Salesforce, ServiceNow and Oracle and that orange ellipse because they're some of the bigger names in the software business. So let's take these in alphabetical order, Ivana, starting with Coupa in the blue. You can see we plotted them next to SAP's Ariba and you can see Coupa has stronger spending momentum, but not as much presence in the market. So you know, to me, my inference is, oh, that's an opportunity for them to steal share, more modern technology, you know, more facile. And of, and of course, Oracle has products in this space, but the Oracle dot includes all Oracle products, not just the procurement stuff. But uh, maybe your thoughts uh, on this. Absolutely, I love this chart. I think that's, you, you were spot on this would be the same way I would interpret the chart where um, increased spending momentum is, is a sign of the company providing products that people like and we, we expect to see Coupa's share grow, market share grow over time as well. So let's come back to the chart and I want to, I want to really point out the green ellipse. This is the data zone, if you will. Uh, and we're like a broken record on this pro program. Snowflake has performed unbelievably well in net score and spending momentum, every quarter the DTR has captured enough end sample in its survey, holding near or above 80%. It, its net score consistently is, has been up there and we plotted Databricks in that zone. It's been expected, right, that Databricks is going to do an IPO this year, late last month, the company raised 1.6 billion in a private round. So I guess that was either a strategy to delay the IPO or raise a bunch more cash and give late investors a, a low risk bite at the apple, you know, pre-IPO as we saw with Snowflake last year. Uh, what we didn't plot here are some of Snowflake's biggest competitors, Ivana, who also happen to be their partners, most notably the big cloud players, all who have their own database offerings, AWS, Microsoft, and Google. Now, you've said Snowflake is much more than a database company. I wonder if you could add some color here. Yeah, that's a very good point, David. Uh, basically, the, the, the driver of the thesis in Snowflake is all about acceleration in spending. And what we're seeing is the customers that are signed up on their platform today, they're not even spending, they're probably spending less than 5% of what they can ultimately spend on this product. And the reason is because they don't yet know what the ultimate applications are for this, right? So you're going to start with putting the data in a format you can use, and you need to come up with use cases or how are you actually going to use this data. So back to the example that I gave with ANSYS, the first use case that they found was trying to optimize leads. There could be like 100 other use cases and they're coming up with, with those on a daily basis. So I would expect um, this score to keep, keep, uh, keep up pretty high or, or, or go even higher as, we, as people figure out how they can use this product. You know, the buy the dip thesis on Snowflake was great last quarter because the stock pulled back after they announced earnings. And, and we reported, we said, you know, my, the, the, the company, see, well, Cleveland Research came out. Remember, they got the dip on that. And we looked at the data and we said, Mike Scarpelli said that, you know, we're, we're going to probably, as a, as a percentage of overall customers, decelerate the net, net new logos, but we're going deeper into the customer base. And that's exactly what's happening with, with Snowflake. But okay, let's bring up the slide again. Last but not least is Zscaler. We love Zscaler. We named Zscaler in 2019 as an emerging four-star security company along with CrowdStrike and Okta. And we said these three should be on your radar. And as you see, we've plotted Zscaler with Okta who with its, its, its recent move into to com converging identity and governance, uh, it gets kind of interesting. Uh, we plotted them with Palo Alto as well, another cybersecurity player that we've covered extensively. We love Okta in addition to, to Zscaler. We great respect for Palo Alto. And you'll note, all of them are over that 40% line. These are disruptors, they're benefiting. Well, not so much Palo Alto, they're more legacy, but the, the other two are benefiting from that shift to work from home, cloud security, modern tech stack, uh, the acquisition that, that Okta made of, 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 of Auth0. And again, Zscaler 
cloud security, getting rid of a lot of hardware, uh, really has a, a huge tailwind at its back. If on a Zscaler, you know, they've benefited from the huge mi mi cloud migration trend. What, what are your thoughts on the company? So I actually love all three companies that are there, right? And the point is people are just going to spend more money, whether you are on the cloud, off the cloud, the data centers need more security as well. So I think there is a strong case to be made for all three. With Zscaler, the upside is that it's just very easy to use, very easy to implement. And if you're somebody that is just setting up infrastructure on the cloud, there is no reason for you to call any other competitor. Right? With Palo Alto, the case there is that if you have an established um, security platform, if you're on their security platform, the data, on the data center side, uh, they, they did introduce a bit through several acquisitions, a pretty attractive cloud offering as well. So they've been gaining share as well in the space and, and the company does look pretty attractive on valuation basis. So for us, cybersecurity is really all about rising tide lifts all boats here, right? So you can have a pure play like Zscaler uh, that benefits from the cloud, but even somebody like Palo Alto is pretty well positioned um, to benefit. Yeah, we think so, so too. Uh, over a year ago, we reported on the uh, valuation divergence between Palo Alto and Fortinet. Fortinet was doing a better job uh, moving to the cloud and obviously serves more of a mid-market space. Palo Alto had some go-to-market execution challenges. We said at the time, they're going to get through those. And when we talk to, to chief information security officers, Palo Alto is like the gold standard. They're the thought leader. They want to work with them. But at the same time, they also want to participate in some of these you know, modern cloud stacks. So uh, we agree, uh, there's plenty of room for all three. Um, it, it, just to add a bit more color and drill into the spending data a little bit more, this slide here takes that net score and shows the progression since January, 2019. And you can see a snowflake just incredible in terms of its ability to maintain that ele elevated net score as we talked about. And the table on the insert, it shows you the number of responses and all three of these companies have been getting more mentions over time. Snowflake and Zscaler are now both well over 100 N in the survey each quarter. And the other notable piece here, and this is really important, you can see all three are coming out of the isolation economy with a spending uptick. Nice uptick shown in the most recent survey. So that's, again, another positive. But I want to close, Ivana, with kind of making the bull and bear case and, and have you address really the risks to the buy the dip scenario. So, Look, there are a lot of reasons to like these companies. We talked about them. Coupa, they've got earnings momentum. You know, management on the call side had very strong end market demand. This, the stock, you know, has underperformed the NASDAQ, you know, this year. Snowflake and Zscaler, they also have momentum. Snowflake got this enormous TAM, um, although they were punished for not putting a hard number on it, which is ridiculous in my opinion. I mean, the thing is, it's huge. Um, the investors were just kind of, you know, wanting a, a, a little binky and baby blanket, but they all have modern tech in the cloud. And really importantly, this shows in the ETR surveys, you know, the momentum that they have. So very high retention is the other point I wanted to make. The very, very low churn of these companies. However, Cooper's management, despite the blowout quarter, they gave kind of un underwhelming guidance. They've cited headwinds uh, they've, with the, the, the Lamasoft uh, migration to their cloud platform. Snowflake is kind of like priced to perfection. So maybe that's an advantage because there's every, every little negative news is going to, going to cause the company to dip. But it's, you know, it's pretty high value because Slootman and Scarpelli, everybody expects them to surpass what happened at ServiceNow, which was a rocket ship. And it, it could be all, argued that all three are, are richly priced and overvalued. So, but Ivana, you're looking out, as you said, a couple of years, three years, maybe even five years. How do you think about the potential downside risks in, in, in your buy the dip scenario? You buy every dip, <laughs> you looking for bigger dips or what's your framework there? So what we try to do is really look every quarter the company reports, is there something that's driving fundamental change to the story or is it a one-off situation where people are just misunderstanding what the company is reporting? So in the case, we kind of address some of the earnings that, that were reported, but with Coupa, we think the man, the management is guiding conservatively as they should. So we're not very concerned about their ability to execute on, on the guidance and, and to exceed the guidance. With Snowflake price to perfection, that's never a good idea to avoid a stock uh, because it just shows that there is 
the company is doing a great job executing, right? So um, we are looking for reports like the Cleveland report where they would be like negative on the stock and that would be an entry point um, for us. So it, broadly, we apply by the deep philosophy, but not, uh, not if something fundamentally changes in the story. And none of these three are showing any signs of uh, fundamental change. Okay, we're gonna leave it right there. Thanks to my guest today, Ivana. Tremendous having you. Would love to have you back. Great to see you. Thank you, David. And def you definitely wanna check out SPRX and the SPEAR ETF. Now remember, I publish each week on wikibon.com and siliconangle.com. These episodes, they're all available as podcasts. All you gotta do is search Breaking Analysis Podcast. You can always connect with me on Twitter. I'm at dvellante or email me at david.vellante at siliconangle.com. Love the comments on LinkedIn. Don't forget to check out etr.plus for all the survey action. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE Insights powered by ETR. Be well, and we'll see you next time.